Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to the Next Reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. Il Postino, the postman, is over. Our smiles spread like butterflies. Mario was a humble postman who lived a simple life on a small Italian island. For years, he loved Beatrice, but he just didn't know how to tell her. Until Pablo Neruda, the famous poet and world-renowned romantic, moved in. Now this great man is about to teach him that every moment has its meaning. He puts the lotion in the basket. <laughs> Jeez. I think Neruda wrote that. Took that. A turn. <laughs> I think he did. Or else she puts the lotion on her skin. Or else she gets the hose again. Classic Neruda. I think you're right. I, re I remember reading that in the <laughs> book you? of love poetry. <laughs> hey, if you want more fantastic quips like that, where should you go, Andy? There's so many places to go, Pete, but Instagram is a great place to start. You can check out all of our posts that we have over there. We've got a lot of posts about the movies we're talking about each week, about other movies. There's just a whole variety of things. We have 
all of our new hosts, everybody kind of every week we do a host pick of the week. So there's a lot of things you can do over on Instagram. Just follow us at The Next Reel. And uh, another great place is to jump into our Discord channel, which you can find over at thenextreel.com. And you can jump into our Discord group and join the conversation with everybody else talking about the movie we're talking about right now and all sorts of other movies. And and you know what else you could do? You could join our membership program through patreon.com slash the next reel. And I only bring it up because, A, it is a way for you to directly support this show with your dollars. If you like what we've been doing for the last nay, nine years, uh, we would love your support. And you could join people like just this morning. Captain America became a patron of. I'm surprised that he beat Tony Stark. I Tony am Stark actually surprised all the bucks. as well. And I'm thrilled to see that we have Avengers support uh, for our little show. Who knew? Who knew? I love that. I love that. Mm-hmm. So come yeah. hang and out. We're always us. looking. We're always looking to come up with new things to offer our members, and uh, so yeah, just kind of uh, become a member, and uh, you'll find out over on Discord all the things that we offer, and it's it's just a great thing to kind of help us keep things moving, and really, it's just I kind of have a great time having conversations with all of the uh, other fans of the show. It comes to join the Instagram, or else it eats a big fat ham. Classic Naruda. <laughs> All right, Andy, let's talk about this movie. Um, you know, it's adorable. Is that, <laughs> does that minimize my feelings about this movie? It's just so cute. Come on. It's very, it's very sweet, very kind of, uh, I don't, it, it is a, just a very kind of pure little story. I, I really do enjoy it. It's, it's a, it's a romantic, uh, it, we call it a romantic comedy. An Italian romantic comedy. Did you laugh enough for it to be a comedy? Is that is it a romantic comedy? Is that what you'd call it? Well, I don't know. I guess it kind I, of is. I kind of struggle with that because it it you know uh, it's also it's also got a fantastic uh, union riot. So it could be a labor movie, <laughs> although brief, it would have fit. <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, IMDb calls it a biography comedy drama. I guess biography because it's based. There's a real character in it, even though it's not really based on his life. Well, uh, it yeah, seems let's, strange to me. Let's IMDb. just clear the air there. So uh, the the movie it does have a fictionalized version of Pablo Neruda, the uh, poet and activist and one time statesman to uh, Spain, I think. Chile, uh, Chile, Chile it would be, for, it would for, be for totally Chile. Different continent. No, 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 for Chile <laughs> to Spain. Uh, and, oh, okay, and uh, and so he was um, he was quite an activist. He was a um, uh, he held several diplomatic posts uh, for on behalf of Chile uh, in and out of uh, uh, Argentina and Spain, uh, and was he got himself in trouble uh, a lot because he was very outspoken and political. And in fact, he did at one point uh, move to Italy. Uh, with with his lover as his marriage was crumbling. And that is where the uh, the fictional Pablo Neruda in this film kicks in. I think that happens very early in the movie, early enough in the movie that it does not count as a biopic. Yeah, I think it's a stretch to call it a biopic because it's not even about him. I mean, it's no. it's a fictionalized and honestly, it's so fictionalized that if you talk to anyone who knows anything about Pablo Neruda, I'm not really one of them. But generally, people who are will say this is all bunk. Yeah. There's nothing here that really lines up with anything in Neruda's life. And so I think IMDb should pull biography off of the label for this particular film. Far Comedy drama. Way. Sure. I'm going to go with comedy yeah. drama and the, the romantic part. I, I actually don't know who the romance is between. Is it between uh, 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 Ruopolo and Beatrice or is it between him and Neruda? Uh, he's Don got Pablo. a serious Pablo crush. In this movie, and it's delightful because he is dopey and charming and clumsy and uh, and uh, just truly, truly lovable. 
uh, and even more so after reading, seeing the movie and then reading his story uh, about how he, you know, made the movie and, and his enthusiasm for the movie and his sad, sad end. Yeah, really tragic. Very tragic. Um, it's it's a thrill that that he was able to kind of get this passion project off the ground, even if it uh, essentially meant his death. It was a tragic story about Massimo Troisi, the actor and uh, who plays Mario, and really kind of brought this project to life. Before before we get to go too far down the um, the story of Massimo and kind of the creation of this film, let's just kind of take a step back and look at you know some of these bigger questions about this particular series that we're in. We're looking at foreign language films nominated for Best Picture. This it's been twenty one years since the last foreign film was nominated for Best Picture, which was Cries and Whispers, which we talked about last week. It is now uh, ninety five, and here we are. Or sorry, ninety four, and here we are with this film being nominated do you feel okay it's it's a weird question but were there that many good english language films from 1973 to 1995 that no foreign films were good enough to be nominated were they just not as good or i mean and this is kind of i you know i don't think we'll be able to answer this was there a prevailing feeling in Hollywood, you know, like, let's just focus on, on you know, English movies? I, I, I don't know if there's a, a good answer for that, but uh, I don't know. What are your thoughts? Well, I, I don't know. I think there is this, this sort of consistent and pervasive kind of Reagan-era geocentrism uh, at work throughout the 80s, the kind of late 70s, 80s, you know, and early 90s. And maybe that has something to do with it, sort of the cultural context. There's also, I, I think, an energy entertainment political context at work here where, you know, minimizing foreign films to their category is something that elevates sort of Hollywood productions, right? U.S. productions. And, um, you know, I think there was there was more of a, a sense during that period of like, let's celebrate what we have made, right? Let's make this about yeah. us. Uh, and also, let's not forget Cries and Whispers was a tough watch. Maybe everyone was just plum hung over from having <laughs> picked an incredibly depressing film. <laughs> they just took a 20 year break. <laughs> we need, we and need then to the, step back the, from these Bergman right, sorts of movies. Then that Il, Il Postino is the, like adorable and sort of uh, just fluffy and uh, just sort of celebrating uh, the joy of love and kind of substance light uh, is, is I, I wonder, like, and I actually wrote in my notes, like, how much does adorable count toward awardable? And, and I wonder if we're going to be talking about that again. <laughs> That that there is this sense of oh this is so cute and I don't have to work very hard at it uh, and it that must mean it's great. Because well, it makes me feel uh, so, so good. two two things that I think that that um, brings me to one we're absolutely going to have to start talking about Miramax, um, yeah. which <laughs> we'll get into that for sure. Uh, two. In context of Best Picture, what does it really mean for that award? Does it make sense for these smaller films like this? And I mean, it happens all the time. It's not like some obscure thing that this film happened to be this small film that got nominated. It mm -hmm. certainly picked up in the 90s into the 2000s I was, as we started seeing some, like, there was always kind of like the token indie film thrown in that was like something that really caught people's hearts. But was it Best Picture? It's, it's like, what's what does it mean to be a Best Picture? I, I, I you know, I, I think it's fine, I guess for a small film to be noticed, but does it? there need to be more to it to say, hey, this is actually a best picture, not just best script, not just best performances, best direction. What is it to really mean best picture? Yeah, and that's a great question. And I don't know that you can actually answer that question unless you talk about it in the context of the other films that it's nominated against. Do you want to just run through the list quickly and we'll talk about the award standing later? The films nominated for best picture this year uh, were Apollo 13, Babe, Braveheart, which won, and Sense and Sensibility, along with this. Mm -hmm. This film did not get nominated for Best Foreign Language Film uh, because it, Italy submitted a different film, which was called The Star Maker. Giuseppe Tonatori directed that film. He had a big splash with Cinema Paradiso a few years before, and I'm, my hunch is that they felt like, let's get him in again, even though The Star Maker was, I didn't think, a great film 
uh, Antonia's Line won Best Foreign Language Film. All Things Fair, Dust of Life, and O Quatrilio were the other nominees for Best Foreign Language Film. Not a very strong lineup of foreign language films this particular year. And let me just run a few other films that came out this year. Seven, Twelve Monkeys, Toy Story, Dead Man Walking, Leaving Las Vegas, Heat, The American President, Get Shorty, Before Sunrise, Casino, My Family, Me Familia. There's another <laughs> uh, film with an <laughs> right. English-Spanish title. Uh, the City of Lost Children, Nixon, Richard III, Mighty Aphrodite. Yeah. Strong year. Strong a lot of strong year. films. <laughs> Right. This is the film that uh, was the little film that snuck into the best, best picture. And I guess you could argue Babe also. Yeah. Kind of, uh, you know, the the kind of obscure thing getting nominated. So I don't know. I mean, I, I struggle with the idea of best picture and what it really means. And I think this is why a lot of people become really frustrated with the Oscars and with awards in general, because it's less about what's really the best picture of the year. What's the film that's actually going to still be remembered 20 years down the road? Instead, it becomes which film had the most marketing behind it in that particular year, the money to kind of push for those awards, nominations and wins. And I think that's the thing that people really get frustrated with. Well, and to confuse voters, right? I mean, in this this film is an, a great example of that. That is, you know, this one is simple and small and cute and wonderful. And there are so many other great, heavy, big films that they just don't know what to do. And this one stands out like a bright, shining light. Um, and so it's it's easy to vote for this one, I think. And also you kind of like I if I put myself in the head of like a voter having seen all those movies, I think, oh, you know, I'm going to this is going to be my statement vote. This was such a great vote, a great film and has so much heart. I'm going to vote to this. I'm going to make a statement. I'm going to, you know, tell people I voted for the small movie. I <laughs> just sort of feel <laughs> feel that sense of, of uh, you know, you're doing a, you're doing a good thing for the little right. movie. Uh, and, but and I think you know we we sort of buried the lead a little bit about uh, Massimo. Do you think his story, right, losing yeah. his life after post production, um, you know, it, suffering through uh, his heart condition during the production of the film, right? Do you think that story then plays into the kind of economics of award choice? I absolutely do. And I think that's the sort of thing that you now I guess we may as well talk about Miramax and the marketing machine behind them uh, that they really started pushing right around this time. I mean, Miramax really started, they started in the 70s, I think 1980, they really started distributing films. And a lot of what they latched onto was foreign films that they would acquire to kind of rework a little bit to fit American sensibilities and the audiences. That's really really kind of how they started. And they continued that even after Disney purchased them in the early 90s, uh, like right before all of this, they were marketing like my left foot in, I think, 88, 89, 90, 91, somewhere right around there. Well, that was like one of the first big pushes that Harvey Weinstein had. And that I was mean, he said this, I remember I remember the marketing push more than the movie. He, yeah, I mean, he had Daniel Day Lewis go speak to like the Senate Committee on Disabilities Act. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the sort of marketing that he was using to really kind of push these things. Uh, Weinstein had this to say in uh, Peter Biskin's book, Down and Dirty Pictures. In those days, the studios had a lock on the Oscars because none of the indies campaigned aggressively. The only thing that we did to change the rules was, rather than just sitting it out and getting beat because somebody has more money, more power, more influence, we ran a guerrilla campaign. And then uh, Biskind went on to say this meant putting on meet and greet events where Academy members could meet Miramax film talent. Weinstein even convict, convinced director Jim Sheridan and producer Noel Pearson to move to L.A. from Ireland so they could more easily attend such gatherings for uh, My Left Foot. And so they were this huge, aggressive Oscar campaigner. They actually got in trouble for Il Postino because they were sending uh, overly elaborate packaging with the videotape of the movie. And I, I guess they lost their Oscar tickets because the Academy found this to be a little too aggressive. But, I mean, they spent upwards of $7 million on Oscar ads for this per, in this film, which is almost twice the film's budget. 
it's just nuts. And I mean, the soundtrack that they released, which we'll talk about that in a little bit. I mean, it was full of poetry by Neruda, read by celebrities like uh, like Glenn Close and Julia Roberts and Samuel L. Jackson and Ethan Hawke and Sting. I mean, it's it was a huge thing that people fell in love with. I mean, they they pushed the Neruda stuff like they they released books of Neruda's poetry. <laughs> they did everything they could to make people fall in love with Neruda, with poetry, with love stories like this. And and with Massimo's story, that was absolutely something that they pushed. Like everybody knew this poor guy died 12 hours after the film, uh, the uh, principal photography wrapped. It was, I mean, and and people, that story, I think, is what tugged at people's hearts yeah. and got the vote for this film. Do you get a sense that the uh, that the. Uh, just general angst around Miramax's uh, m- marketing efforts was as frustrating then to audiences as it is now that so many of these stories have come out uh, in the wake of the dissolution of the Weinsteins? I don't think it was quite as frustrating yet. I think it was definitely in the news. I think this was a, a talking point that people were beginning to chat about because it was something that definitely was noticed. It was like, who are these guys that are all of a sudden like like everywhere when it comes to marketing these things? Mm-hmm. I think we're going to have a much different conversation about this in next week's show when we're talking about Life is Beautiful right. because that is when it was at a point that it, it almost people were like feeling like it was a little... Uh, too much because of the way that it led to things happening at the Oscars. Yeah, there is a there's definitely a second chapter uh, to uh, Miramax, even when it was still Miramax uh, that we'll need to right, talk about right. next week. So uh, a- anyway, uh, all that is to say this is it, it, this is a fine movie. But where do we come down finally on? Is this a is this a best, best picture movie? You know, I I love the poetry. I totally fell in love with this film when I saw it. I loved uh, it. It introduced me to Pablo Neruda and and what he had written. the The film is just just sumptuous and and just kind of very sweet. Like you've said, it's adorable. There's this passion to it. I don't think it's best picture quality. I think that it's a fine film. Um, I enjoy it, but I think there are far better films that should have been nominated. I would say if I if you look at the lineup for best foreign language film, I really I watched all of those in preparation for this as well. Antonio's line, yeah, I liked that one. Dust of Life, I think it's kind of an important film. Uquatrillo, that was a really interesting one. Drop All Things Fair and drop the Star Maker off of the list. Just you know, not films that should be on there. Put this film on there. Put The City of Lost Children on there. Mm-hmm. Both of those films are far more worth it being put on the best foreign language film than as best picture. So yeah. that would be what yeah. I would, uh, my rewrite of history. You're talking about the film itself. Um, yeah. It, it has this sweet little fable kind of love story vibe to it. Um, the Talking about uh, Troisi's character, right, as as the postman, there is, there is, um, a, a sense of wonder that he brings to this character. He, it, he doesn't want to be the fisher, fisherman's son. He doesn't want to take up his dad's uh, role. He wants to do something with, with more meaning than his life. And so he just goes out and he tries to find a job. And he gets the job of being a, a postman, a postal delivery worker for the one house in this area, which is Neruda's house. Bring Neruda his fan mail. Neruda has just landed here. Uh, bring him his fan mail. And over the course of this relationship, our our hero here discovers that he wants to be a poet. And he makes a dramatic, nay, overnight transition from being the kind of schleppy doofus to having an incredible way with words uh it, this is a superhero origin story of the ages for poets because he's <laughs> great i fell in love with him from his poetry beatrice had never had a chance right the thing about this film that i think is interesting and this is why i struggle with calling it like a romance or a love story i i definitely think that's a part of it but i don't think that's what the story is i think this is a story about a person who is lost they they have not figured out who they are and it's like they're unmolded clay and because of this this catalyst that happens in this particular case meeting pablo neruda and reading his words and 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 clicking with with 
poetry and metaphors and all of this stuff. And all of a sudden, having this world opened to him of, of a way to see things that he had never seen, mm-hmm. it, it's a story of a person finding himself. And, and you know, yes, he's able to find love. But I mean, he gets married pretty quick. I, I wouldn't say it's a love story, right? He, he gets married pretty quick. He has he has a kid like he's he's got his own life, but it's really about finding that passion within your life. And that's what it is. I mean, he he is able to start standing up to this this, I guess you would say, fairly corrupt politician who's kind of running the island Mm -hmm. and becomes an outspoken. I, I don't know if he's quite an activist in the communist circles, but he certainly is one who goes to the rallies and is there to read poetry, uh, his own poetry at one of these rallies when he's uh, killed in, in uh, um, uh, police, um, I guess, a uh, police attack. Yeah. I don't know what you'd call it, but yeah. I, I feel like it's a story about finding yourself and through these words that Neruda wrote. And Neruda, I think it's important that he was the one who was picked because he is a poet who wrote amazing love stories, but also was a very political figure. He was in the communist circles, and he wrote just as much in those circles as he did about love. Exactly. In in so many ways. And this is like the, the traditional... Uh, Shazam story, right? It's like Mario says Shazam and becomes Pablo Neruda. <laughs> oh, that would be a story. Uh, it it is uh, Neruda becomes the vessel for unlocking the true identity of our hero, right? I mean, that's yeah. that's the transformation we're looking at, and that's why you know in, in the beginning I I said it's it's a little bit confusing when you watch this because you know there is this traditional like sort of lusty love story that Mario wants uh, to to get with Beatrice, uh, but also his true attention and the the most of the narrative of the story we know how the the sort of traditional romance is going to play out like you say it happens pretty quickly um that that we have this sort of threshold guardian in the ante who is delightful uh who who <laughs> wants to who says you know if he if he has any more words for my uh niece i'm going to shoot him <laughs> <laughs> it's just really beautiful, um, but that doesn't last. That's not something that he he is not able to transcend. The harder lessons for him are the the lessons, like you say, of being able to see the world in a way that he had never seen before. That allow him to relate to the world in a more sophisticated, more nuanced way to understand what's going on. The the, the Mario in the beginning of the film would not have been able to stand up to the corrupt politician because he would not have been able to see with any nuance with any. Uh, with a critical eye, what was actually happening to his fair city uh, about their water mains. And that is a that is a deeply political issue that is so subtle in this movie uh, that it's it's pretty easy to miss. Well, and I think it speaks to the nature of the people on the island. Right. I think you see that in his father, who has very little interest in everything except uh eating and fishing and just doesn't see anything beyond that. And to that extent, that's how everybody on the island lives. Right. They are very much kind of like a much more basic level of of people. It's it's almost like just like the, the animalistic um, base level where it's just survival. Mm-hmm. I'm going to eat my food and I'm going to go catch my fish. And that's like all he can see. And that's what's so great about some of these little scenes that you see where Mario is starting to see these things, right? He's looking at this postcard from, I, I think it may be his brothers or something who is off in America or something. And he's just like, he's fascinated by other things. And his dad is just like, uh, you know, grum, 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 go, you need to work, you know, and it's like he just has nothing to say. There's nothing there for him. Right. The aunt, uh, my favorite line of hers was, I'd prefer a drunkard at the bar touching your bum to someone who says your smile flies like a butterfly. <laughs> like, it's it's so funny that they they want to stay. And it's interesting because later Neruda, when they hear him on the news after or in an interview in the newspaper after he's left the island, um, he talks about how it was so nice to be there and just be with the simple people. And it it really hits Mario in a way where it's like, you're talking about me. You're talking about everybody here. And I think Mario may have identified with the simple people thing until he met Neruda. And now he's changing. He really has opened up like a butterfly. And now here he is. It's like, he's not the one who who is a simple person anymore. And I, I think that that's a really interesting element that the story has is this whole idea of right place, right time. Mario 
he probably had this in him his whole life, but has never had a way to develop it at all. It is only because of this, uh, you know, kind of coming, uh, the arrival of Neruda that all of a sudden things were able to shift with him. And I just, I think that that was a really interesting element of the story. Yeah, I mean, that that's the whole concept of this using this this character to unlock the the sort of deeper sort of secret understanding the uh, powers that have been so limited by context, culture and family. Uh, and I think it's I think it's really powerful. We, we also have, you know, what comes with Neruda is that he's you know, he's a noted communist and there is a deep misunderstanding of communism in this island community, uh, which I, I think is fascinating, especially because Mario ends up moving more in that direction the more he learns about the world by way of Naruto. What do you think? Sorry, hold on. I got distracted because I had written down, <laughs> I was trying to prepare for what you had were starting to say, and then I got distracted by eating babies, and I'm like, where did this idea of eating babies I come from? I want to talk <laughs> about that. I looked up that, I looked that up too, and it's horrible, but I get it. Like, I get it. And you have to imagine in this period of sort of 1970s, right, uh, kind of between 1950s and 70s, that this myth is actually something that it, they're still kind of latched onto, and, uh, you know, it likely comes from the Russian famine of 1921-22. Uh, you know, five million people uh, reportedly died in this famine. Um, and there are many reports of cannibalism that come, that just sort of sprung up uh, across the region, across the period, as they're struggling with food. And that became a central tenet, not of the famine, but of the communists who live predominantly in the region linking political ideology with global reality uh i think is a is is a funny mark of humanity and yet here we are i wonder what <laughs> people will say about the pandemic of 2020 yeah. in uh, give it 30 years <laughs> yeah right 30 80 100 years yeah. Right. What what is that going to what is that going to look like? Uh, it, you know, what, what myths uh, what <laughs> myths will people say about right. us? <laughs> right. Holy um, cow. Well, I, I do. I think it's absolutely fascinating that they they made it such a comic kind of, of line that these characters who were um, they always put that in the mouths of the people who were either um, politically, quote, wrong, evildoers, nefarious you know, creatures or uh, uneducated, right? Naive. Yeah, right. Uh, that, that, yeah. That's where those myths come from. And uh, and I think it's great that we actually get to see Mario transcend uh, the belief system of the island as he learns more. And that's, that's you know, that's great. Well, and that's, that. that's what makes the film, right? Yeah. Because we get, because, I mean, essentially, Naruto leaves and he kind of it falls off the wagon. Mm -hmm. He essentially kind of becomes, I mean, he still has his passion and stuff, but when he reads that article about Neruda and he's like, you know, the, an island of simple people, what I think was great about the way that it, it comes to the resolution is after he reads that and he goes to Neruda's house to pack up the stuff that Neruda's secretary has asked them to ship back. Secretary is rude to come on. That's just, she's just rude, cold. I did not she care for her. Cold. We only she meet her not. in a letter, and I still don't care for her at all. She was very, very cold. Mm -hmm. Clearly never met these lovely, no. simple people. <laughs> but she. But this is where Mario finds the recorder, hears himself in that, in that recording that uh, Neruda did with him, which is very sweet, and gets the idea. It's almost like the rebirth of that. And this is really kind of the climax of the film. As he decides, I'm going to record things for Neruda. And he takes the recorder around and records the beautiful things. Mm -hmm. And he has that line later, when you left here, I thought you'd taken all the beautiful things away with you. But then he realizes that there are always these beautiful things. And this is the this is what I think Mario learns. And this is why he's able to make that transition to the poet, the revolutionary that we have at the end. Because now he's like seeing these beautiful things. He's recording them. He's he's I mean, it's just like the sound of the wind, the sound of the waves, it's the sound of the, the bushes. And I, I think that it's just such a beautiful sequence as he goes around with the recorder capturing these moments. 
Yeah, I, I do too. I think he's. I think it's just terrific, and uh, I. I think it's important to note their editing choices, right? The way they cut that last sequence together, uh, it's a little bit out of order. We see him, and, and yeah. I think you know, used well, right? We see him recording oh, all of right, these wonderful right. pieces, um, and we kind of know what he's doing, right? We get the great sequence of of his postman boss helping him wire all the equipment to a big battery or something, and so he can he can do all this field recording. Um, and and it doesn't play out like I, even though I I know how it's going to work, I it doesn't play out in my head the way I expect it to play, or, or it doesn't play out on film the way I expected it to play out in my head. Uh, it, it's all kind of backwards, and the reward is stronger as a result of it. Right, the act of watching Naruto listen to this finding that Mario has actually been killed by, you know, uh, his efforts to be a voice of growth and change and of the party, um, I, I think is really powerful. It also brings us back to kind of the purity of Naruta that we got to know in the beginning, right? That that he's fallen off the wagon and all we know is, you know, the stories of Naruta, uh, ignoring the fact that he was with these people for so long, Um but he comes back to the island with intention, right? He comes back to the island uh, to experience these people again. And uh, hearing that voice, I love kind of, and, and I'm sure I'm over-interpreting, but I love the way he plays that um, that that journey sort of home, if home is where his heart is. Um, it, it is beautiful watching him listen to these sounds. It's, 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 it's reconnecting with that experience, but it's also re or it's it's also realizing that he has made this big change in this particular person right mm -hmm. and it's like he's responsible it's like that moment where he realizes this journey i had that i didn't think too much of clearly had big impact on you and has changed your life and it's pushed you into something and uh i i just feel like the last moments of the film we have with uh don pablo as he's standing down there on the beach looking out into the sea and you just get these this shots of, you know, kind of a, a closer shot and then just a really wide shot where he's just this little dot on the shore. I, I just felt like, you know, this was that moment of realization where it's like, I've I've changed this person's life. Uh, you know, there's there's been something of me here mm -hmm. that I didn't realize was here. Um, but I, I just I don't know. I felt like there was a, just this powerful moment there and i love the way that uh that our actor played it and i'm totally blanking on his name right now philippe noir noiré is that how, if that's noir, how you want to say noir. it these french names man <laughs> uh okay so let's talk then uh just a little bit about getting it made can we yeah, uh, I already mentioned this was a really a passion project for Massimo uh, Troisi. He had bought the rights to this book, which was itself an adaptation by uh, the filmmaker from a 1983 film called Burning Patience, which is a uh, title. Uh, burning Patience is a quotation from Neruda quoting Rimbaud at dawn armed with the burning patience. We shall enter the splendid cities. It's it, the story is essentially a similar thing, except in, in that particular film and subsequent book, it all takes place in Chile. It takes place in an island off Chile instead of uh, the postman being a 40 year old man. It's a teenager. And so it's definitely a little different. Um, but Massimo had been passionate about this story since the early 80s. And then he'd been an Italian actor uh, for quite a while, very popular. He had uh, kind of been in an I Italian version of Saturday Night Live in the 70s. A bunch of movies, very humorous. In fact, he's like Chevy he Chase. Actually, he's like a Chevy Chase, right? He also he was in a movie with Roberto Benigni, who we're talking about next week, a very popular uh, film, uh, just a very kind of funny guy. And so it was a, a kind of a little bit of a shift. I mean, I'd say less Chevy Chase, more Steve Martin, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's better. That's better. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, but he always had poor health. He had rheumatism as a kid and that uh, his heart was just really weak. And so he wanted to make this film, but he knew he was like, I, you know, I'm not quite sure I can hold up. I, I, and so he talked to Michael Radford. He'd seen his film Another Time, Another Place and said, this might be a guy to co-direct it with me or at least help me with it. Um, he asked Radford, uh, he sent him the script, and Radford didn't like it, but he loved Troisi's passion. And so he ended up rewriting the script with, um, with uh, what's her name? Anna, is it Anna uh, Pavignano? Mm -hmm. 
who was Massimo uh, Troisi's ex-girlfriend. They, Can you uh, she, imagine? I, I don't know how <laughs> that ended up happening. I'm very curious. But uh, Radford wrote the script with her, rewrote it with her, changed the location. This was a, a lot of the big shifts. And this is why Neruda fans are like, this is nothing co- close to the truth. They changed the location from Chile uh, in the 80s to Italy in the 50s. They changed Mario to this 40-year-old postman. And they wanted it to be a little more magical. And I think that's why they shifted all of that. And it, it made less sense with Neruda's real life. But again, they weren't worried about that, like Neruda mm-hmm. fans are worried. Um, but uh, Troisi... His doctor had said, you need a heart transplant. You can't wait. And he said, I have to do this. I don't want to die and not have this done. And so he put that off and they went into production. A week after filming, he collapsed and Radford halted the movie, but Troisi insisted we need to keep going. And so Radford relented, which later he admits was selfish and was upset that he had made that decision because Troisi could only work an hour each day due to his heart condition. And um, he'd, he'd film a scene, one take, maybe two. The the big saving grace, two big saving graces for the film. He had a stand-in that looked so like him that he he did a ton of the movie stuff filmed from the back, everything that was distant, all the shots on the bike riding up and down the hill. Um, and Troisi also recorded all of his dialogue early on, just in case he died so that he had so they had all of that. And, uh, you know, it's just like he knew that he needed to get this out. And he even said to uh, Michael Radford, who uh, said this, um, uh, Radford said, he said, look, I'm really sorry not to have given you my best, but I promise you the next five, I will. Radford said, I just burst into tears because I knew this guy was in for it. The next day, Troisi said to his family, Radford is so sensitive. I was talking to him and he started to cry. I think we made a really good movie. And then, you know, they finished production and like 12 hours later, he was at his sister's house uh, sleeping and he had a heart attack and died. And it that just- is a best picture story. That is the best picture story. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It's just crushing just hearing you go through it. And I've already read it and I am crushed at that experience about, you know, because this is so much a story of a character who is being sort of unlocked by the material that he's experiencing by way of his just sort of vessel through Neruda. It's also Massimo being so transcendently unlocked by the material of the script that he's shooting. Like the parallel is too good for me not to choke up just a bit. It's too good. Yeah, right, right. Absolutely. It's it's incredibly touching. It's powerful stuff. When you hear these stories, it's like, ah, oh, I get it. He he was as taken by the passion and the love and the the kind of butterfly rebirth of mm-hmm. this character as Mario. And I think that's uh, really powerful to kind of see that it affected him so much that he had to just do it. He couldn't stop. And it basically killed him, I guess you could say. Well, and that's why even with just, you know, 14 credits, film credits, uh, well, I guess that's not true, 14 credits, but including television, film and television credits, still thousands of people show up at at his, you know, funeral. Like he's, he was, uh, ended up because of stories like this, ended up beloved. Very much a national treasure. I mean, he's co-credited as director in the Italian release Mm -hmm. of this film. And I, I just think that speaks to how beloved he was how much everybody uh just really kind of uh respected the the story the the passion that he had for it and i mean uh, obviously harvey weinstein loved that too because he wrote that uh as much as he could in all the marketing yeah. which is a little gross when you think about it but i mean that also is the nature of these artists telling stories i mean obviously massimo wanted to get this story out otherwise he wouldn't have pushed himself to to go through all right. of that Michael Radford, a British director, uh, Philippe Noiret, a French actor, a lot of other Italian uh, people. It very much was kind of a, a, a love of a variety of people. Michael Radford, though, he's a director. I mean, I don't know much of him other than 1984. Like, I've never seen Another Time, Another Place. Have you seen much of his? I have seen The Merchant of Venice. Uh, this was the Al Pacino, uh, Joseph Fiennes um, uh, version of it. and and. You know, if you're 
if you're gonna if you're gonna go down on film as Shylock, you know, if you if you want to, then Al Pacino is <laughs> gonna gonna put be the guy to put that in, um, put that on celluloid. I have not seen a lot of Michael Radford. Oh, in 1984, I have. Of course, I've seen 1984. John Hurt. Yeah, that's it. Like yeah. that's all I know is 1984 and this. Yeah. I, I'm just not very familiar with Radford's work. I know he was uh, he's a British filmmaker, but he was born in India, and uh, I just I just don't know much about him. Um, so I, you know, I and it's interesting because a film like this, it it didn't give him a huge directing like he didn't do a whole lot after this like his next film wasn't for four more years and it was a film called be monkey which i am also very unfamiliar with uh it doesn't look like the merchant of venice it hasn't quite crested the six star rule no it has not i i wonder what it is that imdb and i agree on his top four only because I haven't seen any others. Like, I, and I haven't seen another time, another place. But Il Postino, 1984, The Merchant of Venice are three of his top four, <laughs> and I've seen them. Yeah. So um, there's something, something hot about the algorithm uh, there. It's got to be a rule. Well, and it's just, I mean, he's got so few films, you know, yeah. and nothing that's really, nothing that stands out. So it's interesting to see a director like him who uh, takes on a project like this. I just feel like he was there to direct the film only because Troy Easy couldn't. And because, uh, you know, because Troy Easy liked what he did in another time, another place. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I just don't like I don't have a sense that there's much here that Radford uh, did. Yeah. Well, and I wonder, I, I feel like I, I have no sense of Radford as a um uh, as any sort of auteur, right? Like, I, I don't have any memory right. of anything. Like, what would the parallel be between uh, Venice and this one? I I don't I don't feel it. Um, I am curious to see Flawless, though, right? The, the sort of um, pre-Christopher Nolan, uh, Michael Caine. Um, I, I, have, I have memories of him, but it's all been washed away since he started working with Christopher Nolan. So... <laughs> Uh, I, I am. I think that would be an interesting watch. I can't. I sort of can't believe I haven't seen it. It's kind of right up my alley. Yeah, uh, Demi Moore, Diamond Michael Heist, Caine. This Moore, was. Yeah. This was definitely kind of in a period in, where uh, I think Demi was not doing as much, uh, m more focused on motherhood, and uh, yeah. So I don't know. I I don't know. I was I, I was thinking it was a different flawless, but uh, yeah. so I yeah. yeah. What do you think of Noir A? I love Noiré. And you know what? It, it's such a great casting because he actually, he carries the Neruda look too. Like he just, he, he sort of nails it and the performance is fantastic. I love watching him dance with this, with this woman that he's living with that, you know, we know only by Wikipedia is his, you know, reportedly is the woman he was having an affair with um, as his marriage is crumbling apart elsewhere. Like this is, um, it, it's not, it's not great, but I still love the experience of watching him carry uh, the Neruda vibe through this film. I think he's terrific. I think he's terrific. He's magical in the role. Yeah. I really think he's great. I, I know very little of his work other than Cinema Paradiso. That's yeah. the only other thing I think that I've seen him in. And uh, But I, I think he's got just an amazing face and playing Neruda I like I feel like he embodies the character really really well um and I think that uh, you know the the only other I mean I've only seen Neruda on film twice I think this and then the the Pablo Larraín film Neruda mm -hmm. and that also was I mean that's a Chilean film played by a Chilean and I think uh that Neruda also does a great job but it's I, I think that both of them bring a lot to the role I, I I feel like between the two performances um I think there's some some great stuff there yeah yeah and of course we have Beatrice the mm, love yes. interest the brief love interest who becomes wife who be and mother uh and um the object of Mario's uh, affections I think she is also terrific She's great. She does a, a a solid job here. I mean, I I don't think it's a huge role, but I think there's enough of her presence there that she stands out as somebody very interesting. Um, you know, she's she is somebody who I haven't seen a lot of, but she was a cigar girl, and the world is not enough. Um, so I, oh, she's funny. been in a Bond movie. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what else. Uh, like, I just I'm not familiar with her work. She's very busy though. Yeah. 
fascinating. Very busy Italian actress. Uh, and we've already name dropped uh, the the auntie Donna Rosa, played by Linda Morietti, who is just delightful and funny. Yes, uh, character. Yeah. Uh, you want to talk about music? You brought you brought it up oh, earlier. Oh, Pete. Oh, Pete. I love this score. Luis Bakalov wrote, I think, just uh, something that fits so well with. Neruda poetry. I just yeah. think it, there's a magic to it. It's just a romance. It's just this sensual nature to it. It's just it just fills your heart with love. I, I love listening to this score. I'm a huge fan of the soundtrack too. Listening to the poetry, uh, you know, Sting's reading is my favorite of all of them. But I I just think there's some great opportunity to kind of listen to that. But aside from that, just listening to the score, I just, I feel it fits so well with everything going on here. It's kind of the passion, the emotion, the the tragedy, everything just works really beautifully. I think so too. It is one of those, uh, There, there is another score that this fits perfectly for, with, for me. It's a Howard Shore score, and uh, it is the score to uh, Alec Baldwin, Meg Ryan film, Prelude to a Kiss. Do you remember this movie, 1992? I do remember that movie. I can't remember the score. I don't think I've listened to it. Do you know what? You've just heard it, essentially, in Il Postino. <laughs> it, it is the American sort of version of Il Postino. It's the same, uh, it is very same vibe, and it also suffers the very same curse, which is um, a main sort of love theme that is repeated often throughout the film. Like, all of the sort of interstitial transitional location moments are are sort of punctuated by this uh, um, this um, what's it called? The the instrument with the buttons oh, and the keys. What's it called? The, the organ? Or the, the, uh, the or accordion? The accordion. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort organ, of, yeah, walk around. It's sort of yeah. punctuated by this accordion uh, the main theme, and it's lovely and beautiful, and I love listening to it just in and of itself. But in the movie, it's used heavily, and yeah. um, and and so I I have this desire to have more themes, like give me just some more variety. I, I think it's um I think it's great. Luca Bacalov, Louis Bacalov, fantastic. Uh, uh, just short. I don't know if I have that issue with I know, it. I know you I, don't. I, I think it's. I get it. I think it's. I think it's great. <laughs> um, but it's funny. It, it's funny that you mentioned that when you said that about Prelude to a Kiss. The score that immediately came to my mind that I think ha- has that problem incredibly is uh, Last of the Mohicans. I think yes. it's a great score, a great theme. But it's like it's on constantly. Give me some more yes. music, well, not just that same. And piece. that movie is plagued by having uh, a very long runtime, and so. <laughs> It's, it, that, yeah, it, it doesn't help. Does not help. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, all right. Let's uh, let's talk just a little bit about award season, shall we? Academy Awards. We already ran through the best picture list or nominees for best picture. Braveheart won. Um, Massimo was nominated for best actor, but lost to a very big performance. Nicholas Cage in Leaving Las Vegas. I, I you know, I think that's a justified yep. win. Yep. I think Nicholas Cage was great there. Mel Gibson was nominated for Best Director. Uh, you know, just as a side note, Pete, this was the first Academy Awards that you and I watched together. I just, oh, I just have to, I have to point really? that out. Yes, at Lori's house. Huh. Fantastic. On a retreat. <laughs> yes. There you go. <laughs> Oh, Mel Gibson won Best Director, uh, not Michael Radford, which makes sense, I think. I don't think Michael Radford's direction, uh, as we said, I, I, there's not anything there that really stands out as being yeah. special. Best Adapted Screenplay um, was nominated but lost to Sense and Sensibility, and I have to say, absolutely justified. Yep. And I also have to say, Emma Thompson's uh, speech is still, I think, one of the best speeches I've seen at the Oscars, where she did it in the style of Jane Austen. Fantastic. She's, um, she's best original, Yeah, worth it. She is incredible. Worth it. Best, best Original Dramatic Score, it did win, so Bakalov proved uh, that I'm right and you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I could be right and not I, and or wrong I and just, still like it. Yes, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, it's totally fine. Um, and then this was interesting at the David Di Donatello Awards, which is basically the Italian Oscars. Just to get an idea, um, it did win for best editing over there. The film lost to La Scuola. Uh, but it was nominated for Best Film, nominated for Best Music, but lost to L'America, nominated for Best Supporting Actor, Philippe Noiret, but lost to Giancarlo Giannini in Come Due Coccodrilli. Um, Massimo was nominated for Best Actor, but lost to Marcello Mastroianni in According to Pereira. 
and the cinematography was nominated, but lost to La America. And I, I, you know, it makes me wonder if if they're also like, you know, it's it's a it's a good film, but it's not the best film. Mm-hmm. It's not the best performance, um, you know. But man, that editing, uh, yeah. I, don't, I don't know what <laughs> right. to think of there. <laughs> All right. Well, how then did all of this uh, notoriety and marketing help at the box office? Well, Radford film cost $3 million to make, which is about $5.2 million in today's dollars. The film first had its release in Italy on September 22, 1994, before coming to the States. Miramax released the film domestically and as such put a lot of marketing into it, as we've said. The film was released June 16, 95, opposite Batman Forever, Pocahontas, and The Incredibly True Adventures of Two Girls in Love. Guess which movie was number one? Not this one. But for a film that only opened on 10 screens versus Batman's 2,842, this film did well for itself, coming in in spot 13. And if you look at the weekend average, it came in in spot two, right behind Batman Forever. So there. That's right, Miramax. Anyway, the film went on to earn $21.8 million domestically and another 50000 internationally, giving it an adjusted gross of almost $37.9 million in today's dollars, which made it the highest grossing foreign film in the U.S. at the time. That leaves it with an adjusted profit per finished minute of almost $303,000. Wow. But if you take out the $7 million that Miramax spent on its uh, Oscar <laughs> campaign, probably in the red. Not, not as good. <laughs> Fascinating. That is really interesting. Yeah. Uh, 10 screens. Oof. Well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, delightful. Uh, I think it's a delightful movie. Uh, and I'm super uh, thrilled that we have it uh, available to us in the series. Uh, and it's a, it's a welcome reprieve from last week, Bergman. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed it is. I think we no cries, probably, no whispers. In this no, cr- no cries, no whispers. Please. I think we should take it to the mat. Let's do it. Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel. You'll see all the movies we've talked about on this very show. If you swipe over in your show notes and you tap the word flick chart, you'll uh, be taken straight to this movie in the flick chart catalog where you can add it to your list and see how it stacks up against ours. All right. First up, we have Il Postino, the postman versus the birdcage. Um, I will take the postman. Yeah, I will too. The postman or time crimes. Time crimes. Oh, time crimes. Time crimes. The Postman or Night of the Living Dead? Night of the Living Dead. Night of the Living Dead, indeed. The Postman or In the Mood for Love? Mm. In the Mood for Love. In the Mood for Love. The Postman or Dark City? Dark City. Dark City. The Postman or The Departed? The Departed. Weird. The Departed. The Postman or The Natural? Um, the Natural. The Natural. I'm surprised you had to pause and think there. The Postman or High Noon? Um, High Noon. High Noon. The Postman or Creep Show? (laughs) Uh, I might need you to lead me through this one. What are you? Creep Show. Creep Show, show, baby. All the way. Okay. (laughs) Creep creep Show it is. Well, that puts El Postino right in the middle of our list. Uh, we may end up having that as a as a block. Well, that'll be an interesting block right next to the birdcage. It's landed in spot 232 out of 464. 232 out of 464. Fascinating. Yeah, it, straight up 50%. Uh, it, it, it did better on, on my list uh, by a bit, uh, but I'm surprised that uh, that we agree with me on this one. How to do on your list? <laughs> uh, it did better on mine too. Uh, it landed in spot seven eighty out of forty four fifty, which is about an eighty two percent. Oh, it did much better on your list than mine. It, it came in at uh, uh, five twenty five out of fourteen sixty two, which is a sixty four percent. If I go by the algorithm uh, here, then on letterboxcom dot com slash the next reel, I should be giving this a three star, which I think is uh, too low. Not sure by how much. Is it three and a half? Is it four stars? Um. I had a three and a half to four star time with it. <laughs> well, it's four stars for me with a heart. I mean, it's, it's definitely I think a, it's heart, a very sweet down, film. Yeah. yeah, I think it's a very sweet film. I think there's a lot of magic to it. It's very simple. I don't think I don't think it's something that sticks very well. But I, when I watch it, I just am delighted from start to finish. So it's, it's I'd still say it's a safe four. Stars yeah, I'm going to give it four stars because of your enthusiasm. <laughs> OK, <laughs> that's how much I care about the, the purity of our data. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. So that is Il Postino, the postman. Where do we go from here? 
Well, we're going to be riding the 90s Miramax train right into 1997. We're going to be looking at Life is Beautiful, La Vita e Bella. Roberto Benigni's film uh, has become kind of controversial. I'm really curious to revisit that one and chat about it with you um, because there's a lot to chat about with that one. I am. Are, there, are we going to do that, that bonus episode where we talk for an hour about his experience at the Oscars? <laughs> I just feel like I think we, we could, could just do a. I'd like take to the do recording of that and just release it on its own right? as its own episode. We're gonna do a <laughs> a movies by minute episode series mini series where we do one minute for each minute of Benini's Oscar experience. It's gonna be <laughs> right, amazing, right. amazing. Absolutely. When the movie ends, the conversation begins. Amazon giveth, Andrew. As Amazon always do it. <laughs> Weirdly, Amazon giveth quickly this week. Uh, the the one stars mm, boil right to the top. Uh, I'd like to go first, if I may. <laughs> Please. Uh, this is uh, from user uh, Mikhail, we'll say, uh, who says, one star, hail comrade. Uh, this movie boils down to how wonderful some communists are and how bad most others are. If the people that made this C blank blank P we're proud of this film. <laughs> they should have mentioned what it really was in descriptions online and on the film cover. If you get all warm feeling thinking of Stalin, you'll love this movie. <laughs> and so six people found this helpful, which I find uh, amazing because we don't know if he's talking about uh, crap or carp. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I I didn't feel like this was a propaganda movie. I felt like this was uh, uh not even close to that. But I guess you know it is what it is. Did you find some good uh, propaganda reviews? I don't know if it's propaganda. I think I just am dealing with people who are very confused today. All right, I've got two for you, oh, Pete. The a first feature. one, mm. a double feature. The first one that's because this first one is very short. The first one from Amazon customer gave it one star. Who said, this book is boring. <laughs> Thank you, Amazon customer. It's a movie, Thank you. Oh. <laughs> well, maybe they opened it, the case, and they're looking at it like, there's not a lot of words here. <laughs> what? <laughs> there's just a big this circle like a picture. Bonus I don't get it. Disc for the book? <laughs> Uh, the second one is from Trip17, who had this to say, one star. The only reason I'm giving one star is the freaking price of this DVD. Can someone please explain to me how this DVD is priced $731.26? Was it a typo? I realize the movie is fantastic, but unless the disc itself is made of solid gold, I find it hard to believe that this is being priced at almost $1,000, and no one has mentioned that in their reviews. Are people actually paying these exorbitant amounts for classic DVDs these days? I think not. I want to buy the DVD, but for a regular price, like $15 to $20 max. Anyone have any pointers about this? Thanks. <laughs> I, wow. I just want... I just want to buy it at that price just to feel <laughs> what that'd be like. <laughs> what would that be like? Especially because like the other format that isn't DVD is audio cassette and the audio cassette version is $102.55. <laughs> Why would you buy that? Solid gold, Andy? baby. <laughs> Solid gold. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Thanks, Amazon. It's hard to believe we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. You're telling me producing this show week after week is so much fun, but it does require a lot of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Your purchase is made through our links. Give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. We covered a lot of great movies that were adapted from other material in season 10. Our originals page at thenextreel.com slash originals is where listeners can purchase the source material behind all our adapted film discussions. It helps support the show at no extra cost when you buy through our links. 
In our foreign language Best Picture nominees series, we looked at several adaptations, including Z, The Postman Il Postino, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and Letters from Iwo Jima. We hit the high seas with In the Heart of the Sea from Nathaniel Philbrick's nonfiction book for our Aquatic Killers series. Eh, definitely a weaker entry in that series. I bet the book is better. Oh, me too. Member bonus episodes featured adaptations like Gone Girl, The Russia House, Ivanhoe, The Hot Rock, The Big Heat, and Naked Lunch. Oliver Stone brought not just original stories, but also adaptations like Conan the Barbarian, Scarface, Year of the Dragon, Eight Million Ways to Die, Talk Radio, and Born on the Fourth of July. Mary Heron's disturbingly insightful American Psycho was adapted from the Brett Easton Ellis book. You like Huey Lewis in the news? Oh my God, it even has a watermark. And of course, more Stephen King with The Mist, The Green Mile, and The Shawshank Redemption for our King a la Darabont series. Find links to all of these books and more adapted films on our Originals page. That's thenextreel.com slash originals. Every purchase supports our show. Get the full list of books that we've talked about and start your next read today at thenextreel.com slash originals. 